Fire trucks are necessary for transporting firefighters to fire and rescue scenes and a fascination for children, fire apparatus fans, and historians. This classic 1978 American La France is ready to respond in service as an extra ladder truck. But his service in active duty is not too far from retirement. We have a variety of fire engines. For an example, we have the classic 1978 America of France aerial ladder truck. This is ladder truck number 51. What we have here, you can see that it has a, a landing gear. This is called the uh, outrig that drops down stabilize the truck. Then you have the turntable for the uh, ladder. I'm assuming the ladder is about a hundred feet extendable and uh, it's a quite a classic rig. This classic American La France ladder truck is powered by a Detroit diesel two-cycle 8V92 engine. The modern trucks are now equipped with a four-stroke, low-emission, fuel-efficient diesel power plant. This truck here will be retired real soon, and it's been in active duty for many years. We want to give our appreciation to the men and women who have scaled this ladder to put their lives on the line. Let's explore more about fire trucks. The vintage 1936 American de France copper as well as the modern 2010 Pierce fire engine. This 2010 Pierce fire and rescue uh, truck is ready for response. As you can see here, for the ergonomics, it's very uh, modern. For today's fire apparatus and fire rescue, and the truck here is all self-contained, enclosed cab. As you can see here, more integrated system for the, for the firefighters up here. All the controls are up on the truck. Rather than being on the side of the truck, you have your gauges here, and uh, you also have your, um, you have a, a monitor, as you can see here, or some kind of refer to a deck gun. Unlike the older rigs, as you can see, years ago, firefighters had to ride on the back of the truck. Uh, different from the older rigs, the firefighters are now safe inside. Um, and uh, if you notice here, they're able to climb on board and uh, all your equipment is right here for the firefighters. And uh, here's what's unique, the headsets. Great for communication, taking in instruction. From classic fire trucks to modern fire trucks. Here you have a, a four stroke Detroit diesel 60 series engine. Are you ready to hear the roar? You want to hear a classic fire truck? what it really sounds like. Stay tuned. This segment's about hearing the roar.
Ladder 51, Station 3, and re responding. Ladder 51, returning back to station 3, out of service. Well, I guess ladder 51 is now out of service and nearing its retirement. Farewell to ladder 51, station 3, Spokane Fire Department. This particular unit is a tractor drawn aerial ladder unit. It has a 100 foot aerial ladder, as you can see here. The truck here is very specialized because it, uh, as you can see up front here, uh, is operated by the truck driver. And at the back of the trailer, it's operated by the rear driver, which is called the tiller man. Today, we're going to have an opportunity to talk with both drivers, the front driver for the truck and the tiller man. Let's learn about the real purpose of this specialized apparatus. And uh, hello to you, Jerry. Glad to meet you there. And Mike, glad to meet you there. Uh, Jerry and Mike, you both are very uh, special trained uh, with the Spokane Fire Department, station number four. And this particular unit uh, is very, uh, very unique piece of uh, apparatus. Number one, I can see that this is a tandem axle rig. And can you give us a little bit more information about this rig and the purpose of this rig as opposed to uh, a, uh, a three axle uh, uh, platform aerial ladder truck. Well, as you can see, it's uh, got the driver on the front and the back, which is a tiller driver. So they call it a tiller ladder truck. The extra axle is because of the weight of the vehicle, so they can go on different roads or uh, the state lines. Uh, the reason for the driver on the back is we have a lot of narrow streets within our city. And Mike, you know, as a, you're the tiller man? Yeah. Today, great. Does it take a lot of tillery when you're traveling down the road uh, um, in response to a fire scene or, or emergency medical call? It probably depends more on uh, how much time you spend with the driver in the front. Uh, the more time that you have, you know, they know how uh, how much they like that person to steer. Some front people like they enjoy they try to steer as much as they can themselves. The other person just holds it steady. Sometimes they enjoy, especially if it's a really narrow street, go uh, up and rank all the way. So it depends on. Depends on how much uh, time you spend with the driver. Yeah. All right, we have uh, Jerry here. He's going to be uh, giving us a truck demonstration. And we have uh, the tour man right here at the back end of the truck. And uh, as you see, watch the back wheel as you turn.
Jerry. That was a wonderful demonstration. Okay. I really enjoyed that. My pleasure. And Mike, what a wonderful uh, operating uh, this uh, pillar vacuum. Uh, Jerry, do you, do you have any idea, you know, for you know students, uh, especially for who are students who are just graduating from high school? You know, how early can a youngster start right out of high school in the fire science training? You go uh, right into community college uh, here in Spokane has a fire science degree, that you can get. it's a two-year degree. So I would recommend getting into that degree right off the bat. Um, anymore, it's very competitive to be a firefighter. You just don't say, I'm going to be a firefighter and you all of a sudden are one of those. You have, to, you have to test to get the job. And yes. Having the fire science degree helps you yes. um, with that degree when you're competing against a lot of other people. Yes. Well, you both are well qualified, and so it's very obvious. So thank you very much, Jerry, and thank you too, Mike, for giving us uh, your, uh, your time. We certainly appreciate it. Spokane Fire Department, station number four. Signing out. trucks are used not only um, for a car accident but also as well as for fire response again this is uh, I believe this is a working fire so uh, stand by okay what we have here we have several units uh, on scene right now and as you can see a lot of action going on. We have a popper from uh, Station 9. We also have a, an aerial ladder truck. We do have a working fire, confirmed working fire in progress. a hazmat unit, rescue unit rather. The uh, tractor drawn pillar on location. And as you can see, uh, the aerial ladder it's extended up to the top of the, uh, the uh, structure. This is a big structure. Uh, I can see it's on top of the, uh, of the roof. I'm going to step by for a moment and get a little bit more information. We have... Uh, we have American uh, Medical Response, Spokane, standing by. And right now, I don't know if there's any, uh, if there's anyone hurt, injuries, I'm not sure. But uh, at least they're standing by. Okay, um, I'm uh, actually looking, we're looking to the north from uh, Riverside at Bernard, looking northbound. Again, uh, this is uh, considered as a three alarm fire, several units at the location, at the scene. Station four uh, is a tiller truck, the uh, tractor drawn aerial ladder. Fire science training certainly comes in handy. 
The training actually helped firefighters, men and women, on the fire service to use that necessary training for in an event of a real emergency. We have a, a uh, city bus here, Spokane Transit Authority bus. You can see it's, a, it's an articulated bus. Because of this uh, being a large uh, apartment structure, most of the attendants uh, that live in this building here, um, they can uh, warm up on that bus. Spokane Police Department, the Mark Unit, is here to assist uh, again with uh, uh, traffic control or whatever necessary um, duty to keep uh, everyone safe and uh, allow them to uh, just do their job. They work along with the fire department. Again, I want to underscore the importance that the fire department, they're here to save lives as well as to save uh, property. And uh, so we have to hand... Please uh, support the fire department. Yes. Yeah. Please support the fire department. Yeah, they have to do this. They're here to save lives and certainly uh, rescue people, as you can see. And as well as uh, to reduce structure damage uh, due to fire. And the weather here is very, uh, you can see it's snowing heavily. And uh, these guys are, and both men and women, can brave this uh, weather to help save people's lives. There's a ladder. It's, uh, is lowering down. We have an operator, equipment operator, fire equipment operator. trucks seem to fascinate children and adults with this lights, horns, and sirens. Also in responding to helping rescuing people and putting out fires. However, on a more serious note, we're going to meet with the professionals from the Spokane Fire Department. I'm here to meet Chief Bob Hanna, as well as Jan Doherty. Let's find out about some safety tips and gain their insight with regards to safety and fire prevention. Well, I think one of the big things uh, is that people do like to hear those sirens, but they don't want to hear them coming to their house. And so uh, it's really important for everybody to have a plan of action ahead of time to prevent that kind of a tragedy happening from their own family. And sometimes it's just so simple as making a plan, walking through the house, seeing which windows would work, which doors would work, um, thinking about all of their family members, if there's a baby that you need to have, provide extra care for, if there's someone who's older, maybe someone who's older that doesn't hear smoke detectors and you need to have a special kind of smoke detector. Um, but definitely having a plan so you've got two ways out. Correct. And, and the one thing we want to stress is that once you're outside, you don't want to be going back inside because uh, a lot of our fatalities and injuries are from people trying to go back inside to either rescue a pet or uh, obviously, you, you know, you probably will try to get in for uh, people and your loved ones, but, you know, don't go back inside for your uh, your pets. They'll get out or, or their own way, and don't go be going back in for personal belongings. Uh, those things can be replaced. Your life can't be replaced by going back in and trying to be the hero. You know, we're going to get there. We've got the equipment to get in and uh, get the people out if there's still people trapped inside. Another piece about that too is that you're able to go in then with the, uh, when, when the firefighters are fully um, geared up and they have their air masks, they can go into that smoke 
people cannot breathe that smoke. That's the deadliest part. Um, a lot of people don't realize that it's not the flames in a fire situation that kill most people. 80% of the people that die in fires every year in this country die in their own home and die because of smoke. And, and if you do find yourself in a situation where you got smoke in your room, the best place to be is down on the floor. Don't get up and stand up and walk around because that's where all the superheated gases and smoke is at, is up above. And usually about two foot level, uh, it's, it's a lot uh, cooler and uh, more bearable for you to breathe that type of toxins because all the smoke rises to the ceiling. So if you get down close to the floor, you got a better chance of survival. That's right. So yeah. let's talk about some smoke detectors. Okay. You know, um, there's all, a lot of them have a different look to the outside, but even if they look exactly the same, these two detectors are totally different. And what people need to know is two things about their smoke detectors. They need to know whether it is ionization, like this one, or photoelectric. And if you're buying it, you can see it on the packaging. It'll say ionization, it'll say photoelectric. But if you already have it at home, just unscrew it from your ceiling or wall and look on the back. Sometimes you have to look pretty close, but find uh, small letters where it's either going to say ionization or photoelectric, or like this one that has both of those in it, photoion. Why is it important? Because we now know at, in the last couple of years that not just any smoke detector is going to work in every household. Every household has to have uh, a mix, really, of the two because in a hot flaming fire, the ionization one, the one that'll go off sometimes when you've got like steam from cooking, this one will go off 15 seconds to 55 seconds faster than the photoelectric. But not every fire is the same. And in a slow burning fire, a smoldering one with the bigger uh, particles of uh, smoke, um, the, such as the kind that might come from somebody that was smoking and left a cigarette on a couch or maybe uh, from older wiring, then in that case, this one is not a matter of seconds, it's a matter of minutes. This one will go off 10 minutes to 40 minutes faster than this one. So we now know you need to have these. And most people, it's still about 90% of people just have the ionization in their home. So uh, for about $15, you can make your household a lot safer. If you have the opportunity to make a combination of the two, or you buy one that's already combined, and then you have the best of both worlds. Yeah, those cost about $30. And what you have to be careful on this is, is whenever you have ionization, is not to put it closer than 20 feet from the kitchen. You could have a problem. Another thing you have to look at on the back of your smoke detector is find the exact date it was manufactured. You cannot have a smoke detector that you can plan on working that's more than 10 years old. So know your date and know, and make sure you get yourself some photoelectric smoke detectors. I think that that and having the plan probably some of the best advice we can give. And, and that's what we uh, incorporate in our uh, elementary school uh, uh, fire safety house drills is, is having smoke detectors and also having an evacuation plan and how to get out alive by getting down low and how to touch that doorknob and stuff so that you can feel if there's heat outside the door. You don't want to go out if the fire is right outside the door. You want to go out the door. So those are great tips. A chief? What, what, a, what can a person do in an emergency situation in a, in a structured fire? You want to make sure you get out of the building first and go to a neighbor's house to call 911. We don't want you to take the time to call 911 from your house. Uh, if the fire is far enough along, it may have disrupted your phone line anyway, and you've wasted time, valuable time, to get out of that building. Once you get out of the building, run, go to your neighbor's house as part of your evacuation plan. and. The, uh, the fire dispatcher will ask you, is everybody out of the house? Because that's information they're going to pass on to us as we're responding. And, and, and if we know there's still people trapped, we're going to go the extra mile with some urgency to, to get into the house at, at risking our own selves yes. in those situations. You know, I, I certainly want to thank you both for this wonderful, life-saving, vital information. You know, we encourage the audience to please take heed of their advice. These individuals are experts in this area. As uh, citizens, we want to take their advice. Heed the warning. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate it.